or thereabouts. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? Now, our Father, we do thank you that the Lord Jesus said nothing can separate us from his great love that he holds unto us and the Father holds him, that we're secure, that there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, that the work that you began, you promised to complete. We thank you for the incredible rest, the soul that such a truth brings eternal security and how that motivates us to respond to your unconditional love. We know a day will come, our Father, when we will stand before your Son to whom all judgment has been entrusted. And we pray that our judgment as believers, well, that it would be pleasing, that we will have lived and invested our lives well. So whatever season of life we may be in, wherever we may be at in this journey, help us going forward to use our lives for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, this is topic eight in our basic discipleship course. It's entitled Developing an Eternal Perspective. And so we've been looking at a lot of different aspects of that. Most recently, we're in that section in terms of what God will actually judge us for. He will judge us for the things we've done. He will judge us for the things that we've attempted to do. And he will judge us for the motive of why we did what we did. You can do a good thing with the wrong motive for self-glory uh, or whatever it might be. And it can be wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. And now we're dealing with how those rewards will be administered. And again, the judgment seat of Christ is really the reward seat of Christ. It's not a Christian purgatory where God punishes us because on the cross, the Lord Jesus shouted, it's finished, it's paid in full. But it is a time of evaluation. We often call it the judgment of the just because this is distinctly different from other judgments that are found in Scripture. And I know you've had some questions on that, but we won't address those tonight because I'd like to get this handout finished this evening. But we'll come back to some of those questions uh, concerning the five different judgments that you see in, in the New Testament. So um, those judgments are given in terms of crowns. And we saw the first crown is what we call the imperishable crown. And it's given to the believer who lives a self-disciplined life. And by self-disciplined, I mean dependent on the Spirit because a fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Certainly an unbeliever can have an aspect of self-control. But if a fruit of the Spirit is self-control, then the self-control the believer exhibits is different from that of a lost person. And so we explored that, we looked at it, um, and we saw that if we use our time well, knowing the days are evil, as we walk in the Spirit in conjunction with the Scripture, because you can only walk according to what God has revealed, then there's a potential crown there. Tonight we come to a second of the five crowns that are mentioned in the New Testament. You'll see it there, number two, there's the crown of exaltation. Uh, given to believers who seek to win people to Christ. So let's go ahead and we'll jump in. The very fact that Jesus plainly said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, should serve as a gripping reminder that since we have been commanded to do the same, that he will reward us for doing so. What's his purpose statement? Well, there's a number of times when he gives some direct purpose statements, but this is one of them. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And in the Great Commission, given five times in the New Testament, recorded five times in the New Testament, he has commissioned every believer to do the same. And so you would expect that there might be a reward in this realm, and indeed there is. One of the crowns mentioned in the New Testament teaches that faithful believers can receive what is called the crown of exaltation in the NASB, earlier editions, also called the crown of pride in the 2020 edition of the NASB. Pride there being used in a positive sense. Um, there are words that can have a negative connotation like jealousy, and yet God is a jealous God, and yet Paul calls it a fruit of the flesh. Anger, and yet God displays a righteous anger, and he tells us, commands us, be angry, but do not sin and even so with pride. So you can render it the crown of exaltation, the crown of pride, the crown of boasting, 
as the ESV puts it, or the crown of rejoicing as the KJV renders it. For this reason, and this would be a central passage that deals with this crown, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 19. And we'll key a lot off of this passage tonight. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. And by the way, as we've already explored in the lesson, The Christian in the Bible, the degree to which you believe, what Paul just stated there is the degree to that you'll use the word of God in evangelism. Your story or testimony may give you an opportunity or a platform for someone to listen, but your testimony has no power to convert anyone. It's the word of God that is living and active and sharper. It's the imperishable seed that God uses to convert men. And so he speaks of the word of God, which performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the church of, of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of our own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they, that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exultation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? So this crown of boasting or rejoicing or proud pride concerns those people that God brings to himself through faithful servants willing to share the gospel. We'll see here in a moment there's a double entendre. The people are the crown, and yet God gives a crown for faithful uh, proclamation of the gospel. This crown, contextually understood, refers to specific people that the apostle taught and converted as they received the word of God, as he sought to share Christ with the Gentiles so that they might be saved. So that's the thrust, that's the spirit of the passage. Every Christian can and should be an instrument in the hands of God that he might use us for winning precious souls to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus. I hope you believe that. You can be an instrument in the hand of God to introduce someone into the kingdom. As we covered earlier in this handout, sharing the gospel with the lost ought to be the endeavor of every believer. As we are all recipients of someone else's labor. You're here tonight if you are sitting in this seat as a born-again believer because of someone's faithful proclamation of the gospel. Maybe it was your mother, your father, a pastor, but you're here because someone shared with you. And so we read in Romans 10, if you remember Romans 9, 10, and 11 deals with the nation of Israel. 9, how he selected the Jews out of all the nations of the world. And in 10, he gives an explanation of why they are in unbelief for the same reason most Gentiles, by the way, are in unbelief because they seek to establish a righteousness of their own by the things they do, rather than the righteousness that God graces us and gifts us with. And so in 10, he is addressing that, and then he'll say here in verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. And verse 13 says, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, you'll notice that's in capital letters. It's a quotation from Joel chapter 2, verse 32, if I remember. And um, it's a messianic passage. It's dealing with the coming Messiah and the forgiveness of sin and how God will place his spirit within them. But Paul applies it to Jesus because Jesus is the promised Messiah. So you could say, whoever calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved, because applicationally, he's, 
he's applying this to Jesus in its context. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? By a preacher, he doesn't mean he's using the term here in the New Testament, not of someone who, say, is in an office of pastor teacher like I am. It's um, uh, the, the word preacher in the last hundred years or so has taken on a more uh, formalized meaning, but not so in the New Testament. In the New Testament, anyone who proclaims the gospel, which is supposed to be all of us, are preachers. So someone will come up to me and say, preacher, how you doing? And they're using it in a formalized sense. But I can say, preacher, how you doing? Because you're a preacher too if you know the Lord Jesus, right? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. You'll notice capital letters. Where's that from? Isaiah 52. And he's getting ready in Isaiah 53 to explain those good things, the work of the Messiah. And Isaiah 53 is like a, like a witness at the base of the cross 700 years before it happens. And point by point by point, he walks through what the Messiah will do. And so it's in that context that he is speaking of the feet of those who bring good news. Uh, in Matthew 28, 18 through 19, remember that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples. In Mark 16, 15, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And that's important because uh, I would say for the last 50 years, sadly through the ministry of navigators, We've hidden behind the uh, banner of discipleship instead of making disciples. And there was someone in Navigators years ago who misapplied this verse, and it became a popular interpretation in the body of Christ today. Go, therefore, make disciples, and they, in their minds, say, do discipleship. Well, doing discipleship is important, but that's not what this verse is referring to. Now, it does the next verse, teaching all that I taught you to observe, that's discipleship. But when he says, go therefore and make disciples, he's saying make converts. And now he says of all nations. If you remember earlier in the Gospel of Matthew in the 15th chapter, he says, don't go into the way of the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Go only to the house of Israel. It's a limited commission. Now he broadens the commission to all nations. Go therefore and make disciples converts of all nations. Now I love the navigators. But sometimes Christians today say, well, I've got my Bible study and I'm making disciples, I'm teaching them. No, you're doing discipleship, but you're not making disciples. Making disciples when you see someone converted. And we can be engaged in that either directly or indirectly as we've already discussed in week past. Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. There's Mark's rendition of the Great Commission. So in those two passages, we have a clear mandate from the Lord Jesus to share the gospel because good news is not to be hidden, but to be shared. While it is true that only the Lord can do the work of saving, right? We're saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God. It is what? It is this by grace through faith process. We're saved by grace through faith. Now, some Reformed folks would say it meaning faith is the gift of God, but contextually, that's impossible. Grace is a feminine word. Faith is a masculine word. And he pulls together the two by using a neuter word, it. This whole by grace through faith process is a gift from God. So while it is true that the Lord can do the work of saving and rescuing, right? He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and delivered us into the kingdom of his beloved son, Colossians, right? And forgiving, I'll wipe out their sins, I'll remember them no more, Isaiah said, and so forth. Yet he chooses to use us that Jesus may be introduced to those who are lost. That's the wonder of all. He wants to use us in the process. I've never gotten over that. To win... To win the lost, 
Again, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. To win someone lost involves bringing a spiritually dead person, because that's what they are before they're saved, right? We were dead in our trespasses and sins under the message of the gospel that they might be saved. So it's the gospel, Romans 1.16, that is the power of God for salvation. And the gospel is defined as the death, burial, and the resurrection. Now, people use the term, sadly, in the last four or five years, I've noticed on a lot of internet websites, very loosely, oh, that's a gospel issue. And they use it broadly to refer to any and virtually all biblical issues. But it kind of waters down the definition of the gospel. The gospel is articular here. It can be used, obviously, on Gelion in a broad sense of any kind of good news. And in, there are some places in the New Testament where it's used without the article. But every time it's used with the article, the gospel, it is in reference to the death, burial, and the resurrection. And that's what we bring that people might be saved. And that's important to remember. So, you know, if you hear an evangelistic speaker, and he doesn't bring the gospel, he might bring great stories, he might bring some emotion, and maybe someone will get saved because they heard the gospel before then. But you always need to ask whether you're sharing your testimony or you have an opportunity. Did I give enough information so that that person could be converted? Somewhere along the line, the death and resurrection of Christ has to be brought in. To win a person is to catch that person for the Lord. Remember that in Luke 5? Uh, Don't fear, from now on you'll be catching men. First in Matthew 4, he has that first encounter. He meets them and they, uh, he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they leave their nets and they follow him. And that was the first step. And then they're out fishing a short time later and they fished all night, if you remember, and they didn't catch anything. And the Lord says, do this, and the boat's overflowing, and, and they're just absolutely blown away. And it's actually at that location, some of you have been there with us in Israel, that same spot, three plus years later, after Easter, Jesus meets them on a beach, and there's a fire, and they fished all night and hadn't caught anything in the same spot. And there's a reason they're in that spot for that time of year, because it's the place of the seven warm springs. And that's where the warm water is going to be and where the fish are going to be at that time of year during the sea of, in the Sea of Galilee. And it happens all over again. It's the Lord. I just think it's ironic. It's providential. It happens at the beginning, happens three plus years later. And it's a habitual reminder to them and by application to us. So to win a person is to catch that person for the Lord such that he or she is added to the universal church. Acts 2, 47, Acts 5, 14 speaks of how the Lord was adding to their number, that, that they might be added to the local church. So first we become a member of the universal church, and so ideally when you receive someone for church membership, you want to make sure that they're a member of the universal church before they become a member of the local church, correct, right? In other words, you don't want an unregenerate membership that they might be added to the local church, all accomplished by the regenerating work of the Spirit. The Spirit of God does this. Again, Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. John 16, John said, and he, when he comes, Jesus is giving the promise of the coming Spirit. What will he do? He'll convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So I can't convict someone of sin. That's something only the Spirit of God can do. Now, again, he uses the word of God, and he uses a spirit-filled individual to do that, but that's a work of God. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So it's a work of the Spirit, but it's a message that's preached. And so our message may seem foolish to people. A stumbling block, Paul will say in the same chapter to, to the self-righteous, but to those who believe, he says it's the power of God for salvation, but it has to be preached. It has to be heard in him, Ephesians 1, in him, in Christ you also, after listening to the message of truth, 
the gospel of our salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the order is important. They listen. You can't believe something you haven't heard. You listen, you believe, and then you're regenerated. So regeneration always takes place after conversion. In reform circles, they say you're born again before you believe. They're just hard pressed. And in reform circles, they don't believe everybody is savable. Only those that God has chosen. We'll deal with that later next year. Number 12, while in ourselves we might feel timid or reluctant to share Christ, the Holy Spirit is our helper. He will give us wisdom in sharing the gospel. Remember, Jesus said, look, they're going to drag you into the synagogues. They're going to accuse you of this or that and some things you can't prepare for. But God will give you the words you need at the moment. And sometimes, you know, you have evangelistic appointments that are very formal and very prepared, and, and other times you, you can't prepare for them. And so we were away last week at this conference, and half the hotel staff were Haitian. I shared with more Haitian people than I've ever shared in my whole life, as far as I know. I mean, it's just all kinds of people. And then we're in other contexts where, like, God, this is providential. How is this conversation going to be turned to Christ? And God just gives you the idea and what he wants you to say when you need it. Now, in this case, it's in terms of persecution, the illustration from Luke, and even there. Not to mention the needed confidence and boldness. We need confidence, we need boldness. Remember in Acts 4, they were spirit-filled Christians. They were beaten up and persecuted, so they get together. And one, they remind themselves of who God is and that great prayer of how great God is. And God, you see their threats, and, and the place shook, and almost like God said amen. And, and the scripture says they were filled with boldness to keep on keeping on. Now, as they observed the confidence in Acts 4 of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed. And began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. In achieving what is sometimes called the crown of evangelism, we have Christ's wonderful promises. That we will have his power and that we will know his presence. He'll never leave us nor forsake us, Right? That's, uh, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age in the Great Commission. And so there were some people who said that the Great Commission was only given to those 500, and it doesn't apply to today. Well, the promise that accompanies it makes zero sense. Now, I know uh, on the marquee out there, and there's a certain way, too, you're trying to grip people's minds to buy the book so that they'll hear about Jesus, about uh, the end of the world according to Jesus of Nazareth. But it's really not the end of the world, it's the end of the age. Now that's an old translation in the King James, but it's the word ion, it's the end of the age. We're going from age to age, and in this age, the promise is, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the age. And again, we can know his presence in order to ensure effective evangelism. He's the key. He's the key. And until we understand that, we won't see much success. Number 14, God used the apostle Paul to plant the church in Thessalonica during his second missionary journey. By the way, the next course we're doing is in evangelism. Did I, I've told you that, right, for about a year now. So when we're done with this handout, that's the next course. We haven't done it in six years. Um, so I, I, I hope you'll be encouraged by it. God used the Apostle Paul to plant the church in Thessalonica during his second missionary journey, as recorded in Acts 16 and 17, a journey that included many other cities and countless trials as he shared Christ with all who would listen. And that's what he would do. He, he would go where they would listen. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, our central passage that we began with, Paul has just indicated that he desperately wants to see the Thessalonian believers, as he did not leave voluntarily, but was prevented through intense spiritual battle that Paul saw rooted in, in satanic interference. 
But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face, for we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. So sometimes there are different reasons why um, Paul was hindered from going to a spot, and in this case, of course, it was Satan himself. And so the spiritual battle is real. I was talking to a pastor last week and he was dealing with a problem person and kind of recounted all the problems they were having. I said, you need to sit down with this person and tell this person what they're facing is a spiritual battle. They see it as purely human. But you see, we don't wage war against flesh and blood people, but against powers and principalities and evil forces that are at work. Paul is addressing his deep affection for the Thessalonian Christians, feeling like he had been orphaned from them. Since he was their spiritual mother and father, having first shared the gospel in their city. Why don't we turn there for a second, 1 Thessalonians. It's an interesting text. All those books right in the New Testament, letter T are together. And 1 and 2 Thessalonians is written on Paul's second missionary journey. 1 Thessalonians, and I'll look at chapter 2, and maybe back it up to verse 5, for we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. We're not in the ministry from the money. God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. We could have come in like big shots because God made us big shots and affirmed us as big shots, but we didn't come in as big shots. That's his argument. But we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you. In other words, he didn't come in expecting them to bless him, though the laborer is worthy of his labor. But there were situations when Paul would perform a tent-making ministry, as we call it, because by trade as a Jewish young man, he was a tent maker. And he had earned his money from that and didn't want to take money from anyone. Now, he himself would t- teach other churches, you need to pay your pastors. But in this evangelistic outreach, he didn't come in there looking for money. He came looking for souls. We proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devotely and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So there's the gentleness of a mother, so to speak, tenderness, but there's also the firmness of a dad, and he displayed both. 17, here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul has just indicated that he desperately wants to see the Thessalonian Christians as he did not leave voluntarily, but he was prevented through intense spiritual battle that Satan authored. For again, he said, we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Looking forward to seeing Jesus that is coming, which is something we should all anticipate. As Paul looks at the end of his ministry, he said that he would take the greatest pride in these believers whom he introduced to Christ. He said, for who is our hope or joy or crown of pride or boasting or of exultation? Is it not you in the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming? I find it interesting that the apostle Paul did not look back and give in to sorrow, but instead he looked forward to Jesus' return, knowing that the best is yet to come on that day when he would see these believers in Christ's presence in heaven. These Gentiles who were pagans steeped in the worship of idols before hearing the gospel should, should know that he could never forget them and that his inability to visit them should never be taken as a lack of love or care for them. So, you know, in 1 Thessalonians 1.9, it says they turned to God from idols, and yet 
you read the Acts account, and it speaks of the initial converts were God-fearing Gentiles. So remember, there's Jews, there's raw pagan Gentiles, there's God-fearing Gentiles, and there's proselytes. And so you find those four groups of people in the New Testament. Jews who could be believing Jews or unbelieving Jews, and Gentiles who could fall into three categories, some who are hardcore idol-worshiping pagans. And that's what primarily characterized this church, but not entirely, because in Acts 17, he also speaks of God-fearing Gentiles. And a God-fearing Gentile acknowledged that the God of Israel was the one true God, but they had not gone through the process as men of being circumcised. And then a proselyte had taken that step. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Notice they turn to God from idols. They don't turn from idols to God. And there's a difference. You can't clean up your act to come to God. But when you come to God, he cleans up your act. As we've been studying at the judgment seat of Christ, our works will be judged and rewards will be given. And we looked at those central passages listed here in the, and in the Pauline epistles, these rewards are often pictured as crowns, as here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. While he was referring to a literal crown given for evangelistic faithfulness, as seen by his use of the Greek noun stephanos, here translated crown, again a noun used to literally signify an athletic crown and not the royal crown for a king. So sometimes it will be translated as wreath, say, like in 1 Corinthians 9. So there's the diadem that a king would wear, and we see Christ wearing diadems, plural, in Revelation 19. But then there's the stephanos, which is a reward kind of crown. And that's what's in view. Again, it's rewards. Nonetheless, he's using a play on words to also say that these converts themselves would also be his crown of exaltation when he will meet them in heaven seeking to capture his double entendre of both his literal and metaphorical use of the word crown in this verse. Some versions and translations render verse 19 like the Net Bible, for who is our hope or joy or crown to boast of before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not, of course, you? Or the NIV 84, different from the 2011 for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? After all, the NLT says, what gives us hope and joy, and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord when he returns? It is you. Or the CJB, for when our Lord Yeshua returns, what will be our hope, our joy, our crown to boast about? Won't it be you? We've seen this theme already of believers in heaven who have been influenced through the gospel who will someday be there to greet you in heaven. We studied that, if you remember, in Luke 16. Uh, there, the context concerned the way we used our money. And because we invested our money wisely, um, the Lord spoke of this great number of people that will be there because we gave. I was thinking about that today. I took a break and been studying all day, went running, and I thought, we need to get an update on that last Bible translation and see where, where they're at. Because if you remember, uh, we provided three books of the Bible. We've done it twice now, but the most recent group, I don't know if they're finished or not. I need to get Pastor Vince to update us on that. Um, but there will be people there in heaven because they had a copy of the written word of God and they heard it. And maybe the verse that you paid $25 for is the verse they were saved from. Wouldn't that be cool, huh? <laughs> anyway, so, but, so we've already seen this theme is what I'm saying. The joy of meeting believers in heaven also brings with it a serious consideration and that while we may not feel successful, we're called to be faithful. And if we are faithful long enough, we will see fruit and we'll receive this crown. Adoniram Judson was the very first missionary to leave American soil 
Before that, everybody was coming to America to serve the colonies and to reach the, the pagan idolatrous Indians that were here. So he leaves American soil from Worcester, Massachusetts, my hometown. Of course, he leaves as a Congregationalist and the ship over, he becomes a Baptist. Um, but he worked and labored and worked and labored. At one point, all the manuscripts that he had worked were destroyed. He kept going, going 20 years before he saw his first convert. But he didn't quit. He was faithful. And we'd been in our building next door just a few months and a lady came, we started doing meet the pastors, and before that we had to go to people's homes. And then we kind of gravitated into a meet the pastor. Um, and there was a lady there from Burma, Miramar today, right? And she brought her Bible, she got saved that night. Her English was good, she could understand everything, but I said, but you read English? She said, I do, but I prefer Burmese, but what do you think of this Bible? And she handed it to me, and I opened it up, and of course it was translated by Adoniram Judson. They're still using his work. So God calls us to be faithful. And if you're faithful long enough, you know, if you share the gospel three times and nobody responds, oh, I guess nobody cares. Do it a hundred times. You'll see someone. And then again, sometimes, you know, I, when I was at this conference, I got a phone call from a pastor in another state, and he said, I'd like you to call this pastor for me. And I said, well, uh, why do you want me to call him? He said, you led him to Christ. I said, I did? He said, yeah, he was a single Marine here in the Marine Corps 15 years ago, and he came to the Lord, and he's since married, went to seminary, he's pastoring a church in Texas, and who would have known? I wouldn't have known. And there are people that you have touched that you don't even know about. You've talked to them about the Lord. And you think nothing happened. And for some of you, that was the first, sometimes in a long line of people, that brought that man or that woman into the kingdom. So while it may look like nothing, little is happening, it's important to keep in mind John 4, 36. Already, Jesus said, he who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for life eternal so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored and others have labored and you have entered into their labor. When we see someone come to Christ, we must never forget as reapers that the harvest we enjoy is very often the fruit of another believer's toil. Jesus is teaching us an invaluable lesson. Since seed in the past has been planted, and if you study John 4 carefully, it appears that from what we know in John's gospel, this was the work of John the Baptist and his disciples. They were plowing up the ground, preaching Messiah's coming, since seed in the past has been planted, seed in the present can be expected to be harvested. And both the sower and the reaper will someday be rewarded. So sometimes you're sowing seed and someone else reaps it. We have a brother who, um, I would say pretty faithfully, brings people to meet the pastor. and He just shows up and he cares for people that have physical needs and he wants to make sure they're saved. He just brings them to meet the pastor. What a great thing. The people that will be in heaven because of his faithfulness. By the way, any of you are welcome to bring a friend to meet the pastor if you want. It would be a great thing, you know, and it will sharpen your skill, maybe how to share the gospel. You don't want to be dependent on a meet the pastor. You, you, want, to, you want to be able to share Christ yourself. So often the one who reaps or brings a lost person to the point of decision, the pastor, the evangelist, the missionary, gets the honor down here. But there will be no such distinction at the judgment seat of, of Jesus. Many times, some unknown Christian, Christians plow the ground, plant the seed, and then they water it with their prayers and their tears. 
yet never see the harvest. But God will reward those who are faithful stewards of the gospel of Christ. There was a lady in our church years ago. I think I have freedom to share this. And she was so heartbroken for one of her children. And I was blessed to introduce her to the Lord. And she was a member here for several years. And I did her funeral. And that child that she'd been praying for for years gave his life to the Lord at that funeral. Now, she never saw it on this side of glory. But God does things like that. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy or faithful. All who are good stewards of the gospel and the opportunities entrusted to them will be rewarded for our all-knowing Father knows the spiritual history of each soul. You know, sometimes it's just you're inviting someone. I, was, I had my grandson on my day off on Monday. We went down to the waterfront park, and it was hot, and there was this guy who was with Butler dealership, and he had some kind of vehicle there, and I got talking to him, and more importantly, I spoke to him about his soul. You go to church anywhere? He said, I never go to church. He looked about 25 I never go to church. Those are his words. I would love for you to come to Community Bible Church. He doesn't even know I'm the pastor, but he gave me his card as I left, and I'm getting ready to send him a note with a, would you like to know God as your friend file to maybe watch and see if he will. There's people everywhere, and God knows the history of each soul. For all I know, his grandmother somewhere has been praying for him, and I was the answer to a prayer. Maybe I'm just the first in a chain of people who will be the answer to a prayer. In the winning of some person to Christ, we may be the first link or the last link or a link somewhere in between in that supernatural process of God drawing an individual to Christ. The question is whether or not, is whether or not we are an available link. That's the bottom line, right? And no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws him, John 6, 44. That's a work of God. This leaves us all without excuse. We can all be a link in the chain. It also means that we do not have to be discouraged if we see few results from our efforts, so long as we are at the disposal of the Lord, obeying his great commission. All God asks of us is to be available to the Lord Jesus so that he may be used by the Holy Spirit to bring the lost person into touch with the plan of salvation. Jesus said, you do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. So there's different kinds of fruit in the New Testament. There's like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. And here in this context, this is the fruit of winning someone to Jesus. The fruit of a person's conversion. I was speaking at this conference. This guy chased me down because he knows both my sons who are Blackstone fellows. And he said, what do you think of the conference? I said, I think it's fantastic. I said, but he said, well, how do you think we're doing? I said, I think you're doing fantastic. He said, well, how do you think the nation's going? I said, if this conference were here 50 years ago, you guys would be giving counsel to the hundreds of participants, but not overwhelming the hotel staff with tracks and being sensitive to this and being sensitive to that. That kind of stuff doesn't happen anymore. Christians don't share their faith. They don't give a gospel tract. They don't do anything. And I said, and as long as we're on that trajectory, all you guys can do is slow the process down, put out fires. But unless the soul of the nation changes, we're sunk. Now, I prefer Donald Trump, obviously, over Joseph Biden. Do I think the Republican Party has some problems? They surfaced some major problems last week, obviously. 
But do I think Donald Trump is the solution? I think he can slow things down at best. But unless the nation changes morally and spiritually, we're sunk. Our constitution is based on a Judeo-Christian ethic. And when the Judeo-Christian ethic is lost, it doesn't work. So, you know, one of the most patriotic things you can do is share Jesus. But forget being patriotic. We should do it anyway. It's just as believers. Well, I got too political for some of you. I can already see that. Huh? <laughs> Where are we? What number? 36. The Apostle Paul was filled with exultation or rejoicing or pride. But if we go to heaven empty-handed because we do not attempt and have it in our heart to try to win others to Jesus, then we will not experience the joy of this crown. While he admonished the Thessalonians to wait for his son, he also wanted them, as he modeled, to be engaged in witnessing about God's son. And so there's the balance. There's this expectancy that they live with. But in the process, they're witnessing about God's son. The apostles' words for his converts here are especially affectionate, and his deep and strong love for these people bleed through the pages of Scripture. We read some of those a moment ago. He was blessed by their conversion, and he was concerned for their development. The Lord's approval for Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians would be, on the one hand, be like a crown that would make him justifiably proud when the Lord gave it to him. Proud in a good sense, because what will we do with the crowns? Well, we're coming to that a little bit further down the road here. But on the other hand, it was the Thessalonians themselves also would, would also be his crown. Sadly, some Christians today have falsely concluded that since they have not been given by the Spirit the gift of evangelism, that they need not share their faith. These misinformed or some, sometimes simply disobedient Christians who are often looking for an excuse not to obey will sometimes confuse the relationship between a spiritual gift with that of a spiritual role. I'll elucidate that in a moment. The Bible is clear in that just because we do not have a spiritual gift in a particular area does not mean that we do not have a spiritual responsibility in that same area. And so while an evangelist might do well not to focus his time in a hospital ministry in favor of an evangelistic outreach, he still has the responsibility to show mercy. It is helpful to remember that as we effectively use our spiritual gift in serving others, we can, as we walk by the Spirit, become a good model for others who do not have that gift and so encourage them with the spiritual responsibility that all believers share. You follow that? So you may not have the gift of mercy, but you're around someone who has been given that particular spiritual gift and you learn from them. And that's a good person to learn from because that's a responsibility that we all share. A few examples of responsibilities we share regardless of our gifting include Teaching. So there's the gift of teaching, right? But there, these passages deal with the responsibility of teaching. By this time, you ought to be teachers. And it's you, you all, you all meaning all you that I'm writing this letter to in Hebrews 5. You ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you the elementary principles. So while there's the gift of teaching, the gift of pastor teacher, there's a responsibility to teach. Giving. Some people have the gift of giving. We're all called to tithe. Some people have the gift of mercy. We're all called to show mercy. Some people have the gift of serving. He that would be great among you must be the servant of all. Some people have the gift of evangelism. Timothy is commanded to do the work of an evangelist. And in the Great Commission, we're all commanded to share the gospel with everyone. So on knowledge, exhortation, discernment, wisdom. Those are all examples where these are all, by the way, spiritual gifts listed in the four central passages on gifts in the New Testament, but they're equally spiritual responsibilities. So it's very interesting. There's 20 gifts that are listed in the New Testament, four of which are sign gifts, right? Miracles, healing, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. But with the 16 non-sign gifts, there's a common responsibility we all share. So we can't hide behind that. Well, that's not my gift. 
Doesn't matter. It's your responsibility. I don't have the gift of serving. I guess I won't serve. Oh, really? <laughs> you know? So, we're, we're, one, we're never consistent. But the scripture is clear. So, if we expect to, for God's glory to receive this crown, then we must share Christ. Charles Luther, we used to sing this hymn when I was a new Christian. I don't think I've sung it in 40 years. He was a pastor born in Worcester, Massachusetts. There he is. And goes and he pastors a church in Connecticut. In fact, and one of the members under his shepherding is Fanny Crosby. And uh, he ends up in New York where he spends most of his life pastoring. That's where he's buried. But uh, that famous hymn, Must I Go Empty-Handed? Must I go in empty-handed, thus my dear Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give him. Lay no trophy at his feet. Must I go in empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty-handed go? O ye saints, arouse, be earnest. Up and work while yet tis day, ere the night of death or take thee strive for souls while you still may he was actually inspired to write that hymn and that as a pastor he led a young man to christ he was 17 years old but he was on his deathbed and he lived a month and when charles luther came in to visit him and to pray with him he said i'm so thankful for my salvation but I haven't led anyone to Christ. I'm going to go to heaven empty-handed. And that was the impetus for him writing that great hymn that we used to sing often in evangelicalism. Our Father, we thank you for someone who is faithful with us, maybe to invite us to church, to a picnic, to an outreach, to share their testimony, to give us the gospel that we might believe and be saved. We know you've entrusted us to do the same. No matter what our stature in life is, you've put us in so many different places, even in this room and those who are live streaming, listening. Represent so many different places and avenues for ministry that are unique to them. So help us to be sensitive. We think of our Savior who said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That if indeed we are following him, we will fish for men. We know it is your work to convert, that we can convert no one. That it is the Spirit who convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It reveals the truth of the gospel. But we are so thankful that you would use us for how will they call upon him and whom they have not heard and how will they hear unless someone tells them. So help us to be faithful stewards of the gospel that you've entrusted to each of us, we ask in Jesus' name.